On Tuesday, a giant puppet called Little Amal, the Arabic word for hope, arrived at COP26 in Glasgow after walking some 8,000 miles across Europe to join an event highlighting gender equality. Little Amal represents a Syrian refugee girl. She was there to call attention to refugee children living on the front lines of the climate crisis, which is a driving force behind displacement and migration from sea level rise and drought to hurricanes, flash floods floods and fires. The world's richest countries have responded by militarizing their borders and treating the humanitarian crisis as a security issue. NATO's Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg attended this year's U.N. Climate Summit, marking the first time a top military alliance leader came to the climate talk since they began. On Tuesday, U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi traveled to the COP26, along with other Democratic lawmakers, like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and raised Raise the issue of security during a news conference. This is part of her exchange with Abby Martin of The Empire Files. Speaker Pelosi, you just presided over a, a large increase in the Pentagon budget. This Pentagon budget is already massive. The Pentagon is a larger polluter than 140 countries combined. How can we seriously talk about net zero if there is this bipartisan consensus to constantly expand this large contributor to climate change? National security advisors all tell us that the climate crisis is a national security matter. Uh, it is, of course, a health matter for our children, the water they drink, the air they breathe, etc. It is a jobs issue between clean, good, clean technologies uh, being the future of our workforce and the training for all of that. It is a national security issue because of the uh, uh, all of the con conditions that climate crisis produces. I won't go into all of them, but they do ca are cause for migration, conflict over habitat and resources, and again, uh, a security challenge globally. The Defense Department sees this systemically, that we have to stop it as a national security issue, and one way to do that is to stop our dependence on fossil fuels, which exacerbate the climate crisis. With that, I thank you all for being here. Unfortunately, they're telling us they have to clean the room. So that's Nancy Pelosi at the COP. And you can see our extended discussion yesterday on the military and the climate emergency. Well, the press conference is over that Pelosi spoke at. But we continue the conversation now with two guests from Glasgow. Inside COP26, with the grassroots delegation It Takes Roots, is Sandra Denis, executive director of the Miami Workers' Center. And joining us outside, Nick Buxton, with the transnational Institute, co-author of their new report, Global Climate Wall, How the World's Wealthiest Nations Prioritize Borders Over Climate Action. Before we talk about specific countries like Haiti, Nick Buxton, talk about your findings, this prioritization of the militarization of borders over dealing with the climate emergency. Well, I think it was interesting just hearing—thank you, Amy, for the invitation to be here. I think it was interesting we heard there um, that climate uh, is being discussed by Nancy Pelosi, but it's not been discussed as an issue about how we address climate migration. There she described migration as a security threat, and that is the only way that climate and migration has been discussed at this summit. And, and that doesn't surprise me, because what we've looked at in our recent report was Really, where's the money going? Because we know that money is one of the big conversations here. Are the richest countries going to deliver their promised $100 billion in climate finance, which is wholly in inadequate, and yet they fail to deliver that? So we decided to compare what they have actually delivered in terms of climate finance with how much they're putting towards border in immigration enforcement. And what we found is that the richest countries are spending are these the richest and the historical emitters of greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, we're talking about seven countries here, uh, US, UK being some of the two big ones, uh, are spending twice as much on border and immigration enforcement as they are on actually providing climate finance. So what we're seeing really is that the richest countries are building a climate wall against the consequences of climate change. Uh, rather than dealing with the causes and rather than providing the money that would enable people to both stay um, if they are affected by storms and extreme weather or to leave and find safety 
if they are forced uh, to travel away from their homes because they've been destroyed. And Nick Buxton, how do these nations rationalize these policies, given the fact that international capitalism is constantly seeking to tear down national boundaries for the flow of goods, uh, whether it's lower tariffs, whether for the free flow of money and investment? Uh, so how can they, uh, they justify erecting walls uh, for, uh, against migrants while at the same time tearing down walls for capital? Well, I think, I mean, that's that's really clearly part of this whole COP, and when we see it um, here, that they really the whole, uh, it's unfolding that the climate negotiations are really about how to provide business uh, freedom, and at the same time, that depends on the control and the exploitation of labor. Um, and and it, the, the border has become a front line for this. Uh, so if we are to have corporations moving freely, if oil is to continue to extract, um, no matter of the costs, um, then we are going to have to have consequences. And so those consequences be controlled. And of course, behind this is the whole industry. We've discovered that it's quite interesting that the, the, the biggest border security companies um, are also uh, not only controlling the border, but they're also working with the oil firms to defend their assets. So what we really see here is that security, freedom of capital um, and the, the chance to exploit and to make profits also depends on the control of borders and of vulnerable peoples. Um, and that comes, and there's a whole industry now that is profiting from the consequences of climate change, not just the oil industry, which of course has a business model which is based on wrecking the planet. But there's also now an increasing industry arising who can see that, who also benefit from more and more grave consequences, uh, a military and a border security industry uh, that is expected to be worth $65 billion. That's a gross understatement. It's just part of their industry by 2025. Uh, but it's an industry that is really uh, profiting from this climate crisis. And how are some of the major fossil fuel companies, Chevron, Exxon, Mobil, are they also involved in border militarization? They're not directly involved, but like I said, they are. They contract the services of of these uh, of these border security companies. So, for example, um, Exxon Mobil uh, works with L3 Harris. Now, L3 Harris is one of the major U.S. border contractors that's involved on the border and the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, now, they also work with Exxon Mobil uh, to provide what's called maritime domain awareness, essentially. Um, controlling uh, the area of the Niger Delta, where we know a lot, huge amounts of pollution have happened and people, communities there have been fighting for a long time uh, to both end the extraction that's destroying their life and that is destroying our planet. Now, B, now ExxonMobil is using a border security and an arms firm to do it. So there, there, are, very strong, there are very strong ties between, between these two industries. Another key, key example is BP is working with Palantir. And there's big campaigns in the US right now about Palantir because it's very much involved in ICE, um, in, in, in surveillance operations of migrants in the US. Well, it also provides real-time drilling data uh, to, to BP. Uh, so these industries are, are very much tied. And they also share, they even share corporate executives. So we found that Chevron has, has the former CEO of both um, Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman on its board, so there's a lot of uh, there's not uh, there's a lot of um, indirect ties. Like I said, they're both industries that can profit from a climate crisis. Let's bring Sandra Denis into this conversation. Uh, Nick is outside the COP in Glasgow, though, and Sandra, you're inside uh, the UN Climate Summit in Glasgow, just in front of that revolving globe. Um, you are uh, with the Haiti, the Miami Workers Center. You're Haitian American. I can't think of a country that is more affected by the climate right now. I'm wondering what words you have for the Biden administration. President Obama just gave a speech. President Biden last week. Nancy Pelosi just gave it. Um, 
What message you have for the Biden administration about what should be happening when it comes to would you describe Haitians as climate refugees and talk about what asylum seekers in Miami, where you're from, what they're fleeing? Absolutely. And again, thank you for having me. Um, for sure, um, just a few months ago, we saw 17,000 um, Haitians and people, black folks from Africa um, at the Texas, um, in Texas at the U.S. Mexico border, um, really being denied their human rights, not necessarily, not even given a chance, majority of them, to even ask. A, for asylum, which is a right of theirs. And in turn, what we saw was, again, an increased, um, you know, border patrol, um, folks really being rounded up, horses, and, you know, what we would say, whips. Um, and that was the response when folks were actually, people from Haiti were fleeing um, the 2010, 2021 now earthquake that just happened. Um, we've seen homes decimated, increased heat. We've seen folks lose all of their um, belongings in one day and, you know, having to flee their homes that they actually don't want to leave. And so when their environment that folks are living in actually um, is destroyed before them, um, they also are asking for um, countries such as the U.S., who um, one of the, you know, biggest countries that um, pollutes the earth to be accountable, um, and that's not what we're seeing. Um, and that's what we're hearing from folks in Miami, that they are not leaving their homes because they don't love their homes, but again, they're leaving because they're, they don't recognize their homes anymore based on the climate disasters, earthquake after earthquake, hurricane storms, drought, their food sources being poisoned. Um, so much has happened in the country. Um, and those are the stories that on the ground that I definitely wanted to lift up. And Sandra, you're on the inside of the COPPA as part of the It Takes Roots delegation. Uh, what are you focusing on in, uh, uh, in the meetings and what's been the reaction of the, the national delegations or delegates that you've uh, been able to talk to? Absolutely. We are focused on real solutions. There's been a call for net zero. We know that is not the solution. We, are, we want real reductions, um, which equates to real solutions. And for us, that is growing the care economy, a low carbon industry where people who are on the front lines, overwhelmingly Miami Worker Center organizes domestic workers, folks who are our first responders. Um, we believe that um, instead of investing in and more border, border patrol, what we should be investing in is in the people in these industries that are low carbon, but also are the first folks to respond when there is a climate disaster. That's what we're lifting up. Um, we'll continue to lift that up and really tell the stories of the folks who are on the front lines, who are the first impacted and worst impacted. This net zero that folks are talking about um, doesn't work for us. 20, 30, 20, 40, you know, we don't have that much time because people from Haiti, people in Miami, people in, um, in coastal cities are experiencing the impact of climate change right now and have been experiencing it for quite some time now. Sandra Denis, we want to thank you for being with us with the Miami Workers Center and the It Takes Roots delegation at the COP26 UN Climate Summit in Glasgow. Nick Buxton with Transnational Institute will link to your report, Global Climate Wall. Next up, we'll speak to the famed Indian writer Amitav Ghosh, author of the new book, The Nutmeg's Curse, Parables for a Planet in Crisis. Stay with us.